What's up everyone? Kevin here from Skywatcher and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday 10 a.m. Pacific right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. And of course at the end of the month we have a special guest to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Now it is the beginning of May. I have no idea where the year has gone but we are now five months into 2023 and that's crazy so uh today we're talking about uh what's up for the night skies of may here in 2023 um it is uh cinco de mayo today as well so uh so basically it's may 5th so 2023 but anyway we're gonna get uh started with it if you like what you see here on the what's up webcast please go ahead and subscribe leave a like on a video lets us know we're doing a good job uh you can also email us your ideas for a future episode at info at skywatcherusa.com title it what's up we'd love to hear from you and uh, any ideas that you guys would like us to do for a future episode if you want to stay up to date with what's going on at Skywatcher, go over to skywatcherusa.com. Up at the top, hit subscribe and save and put in your uh, email information. That puts you on our email list. Uh, we send an email blast out every week talking about what the topic of today, this week's episode is going to be for the webcast. Of course, if there's any sales or anything like that, you can be all a part of what's going on here at Skywatcher. So, uh, before we get started, really quick, uh, if you want some cool Skywatcher swag to go with your equipment, please go over to skywatcher.threadless.com. We've got all kinds of cool shirts. We have leggings. We have all kinds of crazy stuff is available um, at the uh, Threadless store for Skywatcher. Uh, we did see some of you wearing those at Neef, so definitely appreciate the support there. Um, but you can go over to skywatcher.threadless.com to learn all about the different types of cool things that we have for swag to go along with your Skywatcher product. All right, let's start with the brightest thing in the nighttime sky. Of course, it's the moon. Um, new moon this month is May 19th. So towards the middle end-ish portion of the month, that's when we will be in our darkest. Um, that means your dark sky weekend is going to be the 20th and 21st. Um, if you want to know where Skywatcher is going to be for the new moon of this month, we'll be at Texas Star Party starting on May 15th, I believe we will be out there. So come by if you're in tech, at the Texas Star Party, say hi. Come check out the CQ350, Star Adventure, GTI, Quattro uh, 150. We'll also have Trevor and Ashley from Astro Backyard will be hanging out with us at Texas Star Party this year. So if you're going, stop by, say hi, and uh, we'll definitely see you there. But the dark sky weekend of this month is the 21st and the, tw the 20th and the 21st. So that's what will be the dark sky weekend. Um, probably already have plenty of stuff planned. Uh, full moon, of course, is actually today, May 5th. Um, and it's going to be what's known as the flower moon. Uh, spring is here officially here in the northern hemisphere. This is generally when flowers tend to bloom and thus the reason that is called the flower moon. Uh, all full moons have a variety of different names. You can go out online. Uh, Farmer's Almanac is a great place to go up and learn all about the different names of the full moons and all the history that comes with it as well. Um, I would like to make one point. I forgot to mention this earlier. Today is a pre-recorded episode. I'm out of town. I wasn't able to be here to do it live. Uh, so just letting you know, today is a pre-recorded episode, which you've probably already figured out if you're watching this because you probably saw the countdown before the episode. But anyway, um, today is pre-recorded. All right, so that's the moon. So if you're going out to a dark sky site, head out to the 20th and 21st. That would be the dark sky weekend. Hopefully you get some good stuff. We are at the beginning of Milky Way season as well. The Milky Way is starting to rise kind of mid uh, around midnight um, is when it really starts to come up. Uh, but that'll be kind of cool. And of course, the full moon, like I said, is today, Friday, May 5th. Uh, planets. Uh, we're pretty much done with planet season, uh, at least for the first part of 2023. I'm going to go ahead and bring up Stellarium. Uh, if you're not familiar with Stellarium, this is a free app that you can get online. It's a planetarium software. It's very nice, actually. And you can actually control telescopes with it if you want, uh, as well with the proper setup. But this allows us to see what's going on in the evening. 
Uh, so right now, the big planet that is naked eye visible, of course, is Venus. Venus is hanging out there in the western part of the sky. Very big, very bright. Um, you really can't miss it at all. Uh, so Venus is hanging out there. Of course, Mars is still hanging up in Gemini. Mars right now is moving away from us, so as far from ideal as far as observing goes. Um, it does look like an orange little ball, but there's not a lot of detail there. Uh, Venus at the moment is still in a, I believe it's a gibbous, yeah, it's still in a gibbous phase. Um, that's the cool thing I like about Venus is like the moon. Um, you can have phases on it. That's also the same for Mercury. Uh, I really enjoy Venus when it's more of a crescent. Uh, it's, it looks pretty neat to see a little crescent in the telescope. But right now we're in a gibbous phase. Um, eventually it'll come back around and we'll be in the crescent phase. Mercury does the same thing, by the way. Uh, so that's Venus. That's Mars. Those are the big naked eye planets. All the other good ones are basically gone. Um for until probably in the fall is when they'll make their appearance like Jupiter and Saturn will make their uh, appearance once again in the evening sky right now they're going to be more morning planets so if you're a morning person or if you're really into the planets you're going to be getting up early to look at them in the early morning skies but that's pretty much it for the planets um, definitely not planet season at the moment unless you're an early riser I am not uh, the sun. The sun is also kicking up uh, quite a bit of cool details right now, particularly in hydrogen alpha if you're using a narrowband solar filter. Uh, I will like to take a moment to say, please do not observe the sun without actually doing your homework on understanding what kind of equipment you're going to need, how to be safe with observing the sun because it is dangerous. Get yourself a proper filter. You can actually go back. A few years now but you can go back and look at the what's up webcast where we actually talk about safe solar observing and the different types of filters and what to look for there's a couple episodes out there that we talk about that um, but please be safe never observe the sun without the proper filtration and especially don't do it without understanding what you're doing uh, it's very dangerous but uh, if you want to know more about that go look at our previous episodes but right now uh, the sun is really throwing a very nice uh, collection of detail right now let's check it today today's actually the third of may when this was recorded very nice prominences um, a nice collection of sunspots kind of like a, a little sea of sunspots right here there's an active region there one two three four about five nice sunspots and there a big old filament up here and some nice little detail uh, around there but if you have a hydrogen alpha solar filter like a lunt solar systems uh, telescope or filter set or a day star something like that get out there do some observing of the sun and hydrogen alpha if you don't um maybe you have a white light filter um i could actually just go over to space weather so dot com this is a good one um there's all the sunspots. actually if you've got a white light solar filter this is actually very nice because there's a huge collection of sunspots that are leaving the disk of the sun. And then there's a huge collection coming onto the sun. So it's actually pretty cool to right now. It's a pretty good time to actually have a white light solar filter as well. Um, definitely a good one to have on board if you need uh, to be observing the sun at all. But a white light filter is a great introduction into solar astronomy. They're fairly affordable. Um, and they're available from different companies. I usually get mine from uh, Spectrum Telescopes is where I've gotten a collection of my white light filters um, for a variety of different telescopes. Daystar is actually starting to make their own white light filters. And the nice thing about the Daystar filters is they are polishing them in-house and they are much higher grade of uh, quality uh, than a lot of these other ones. So if you're looking for a white light filter, the Daystar ones look very promising. We saw them at Neef. Uh, they look very high quality. They're polished higher optical standards than most of these other solar filters. But um, if you do want a good, just general affordable filter, I really recommend going over to like Spectrum Telescopes and buying uh, some filters from them. AstraZap makes good ones. I think Thousand Oaks is still doing it. There's a lot of different companies that are doing it. 
Um, I've just worked with Spectrum recently, so um, they do very nice. Uh, but that's your white light view of the sun. Um, and then you have the hydrogen alpha view of the sun. Um, very, very cool stuff going on the sun right now. And of course, as we get closer and closer to October, we have the annular eclipse um, through North America. And then, of course, the big one uh, in April for the total solar eclipse. So make sure you are getting your equipment now because we are really getting into that nitty gritty um, stuff where there is demand is really starting to ratchet up and you're really losing time uh, because you're probably going to have to wait to get some of the more exotic solar filters like the hydrogen alpha filters. You're really losing time um, that you're going to have to place the order and wait to get your equipment and you don't have a lot of time left for the at least the annular or partial eclipse wherever you are in the country in October. But as we get closer and closer to April of next year, it's going to get ridiculous. So make sure you're getting your solar equipment now. And because every week that goes by, it's just going to get worse and worse uh, on the demand and you're losing time. So don't wait to the last minute. Make sure you get your solar glasses, your filters, whatever you need. P put the order in now or try to buy it now um, because it's going to get a lot harder the closer and closer we get. So anyway, that's the sun. Um, very nice stuff going on today. I like using, uh, let me bring it back up here really quick. Uh, this is gong. Um, just go onto Google and type in G O N G H alpha, um, and look up, uh, what the sun's doing today. This changes every day. And if you want the space weather, um, image, you can go over to spaceweather.com and see the white light, uh, version. Um, these update all the time. Uh, so definitely go over, check it out. Meteor showers. Um, we do have one big meteor shower. It's actually going on right now. Um, it's the Eta Aquarius. Uh, the problem with this one is you're still looking at about 30 meteors per hour, which is pretty good. But it's full moon. So there's a big bright moon up in the sky that's basically wiping out uh, the ability to see some of those fainter meteors. Um, so this one's not very well placed this time of year. You're still going to get some. You'll probably see a handful of shooting stars if you're out and about um, and looking and just timing it right. There'll be some bright ones, but not nearly as good as if it were on like a new moon uh, night where it's nice and dark. So this one, unfortunately, the full moon is actually uh, causing a little bit of issue um, on that. Um, I just realized what the other... Uh, Oh, wait, I already had it. I'm sorry. Never mind. Uh, I thought there was a page that I didn't have ready to go, and turns out I did. So let me get this all squared away. All right. So, yeah, meteor showers. There's a good one. It's happening right now. It's just not well placed because of the full moon. So that's the Ada Aquarian meteor shower. That's the big one for May. All right, next up, comets. Uh, comets right now, um, there are some interesting ones. Uh, this is cometchasing.skyhound.com. Uh, this is where I tend to go uh, if I want to look up what comets are available or what interesting ones are actually coming around. Um, this is a very detailed website of how to find what comets are visible or could be interesting um, in the coming months. So, um, they give you some notes and then down here a little bit further, they give you kind of the visibility. Um, right now, the brightest one, which isn't even visible here in the Northern Hemisphere is C2017 K2 Pan Stars. That's looking at about 10th magnitude, 10 and a half magnitude. Definitely telescopic. All these look to be telescopic. Um, yeah, that looks to be the brightest one at 10th magnitude. So right now there's nothing big um, in the nighttime sky. Um, it looks like we could get some interesting ones that'll pop up over the next year or so. Um, this one, C2022, 2023, A3, um, could get pretty interesting in September of 2024. Um, we're only talking about half an AU between Earth. That's pretty impressive. Um, so maximum brightness is planned for about October, 2024. This could be a very interesting one. So we want to keep, uh, an eye on C2023 A3. 
Um, that could be interesting in about a year and a half from now. Um, this new one, C2023 E1 Atlas, um, is saying it could be reach its maximum brightness in August, uh, but it's still only 11th and a half magnitude, so that's still fairly faint, and it's a telescopic target all the way. Um, there's nothing else really sitting here at the moment that looks like it's going to be groundbreaking, but with comets, they always change there's always something exciting that could happen so this is a good one to actually keep an eye on because things change with comets all the time uh so that'd be cool to watch and keep an eye on what is occurring um with all that so all right that takes care of comets uh deep sky target so we're in spring at this point and spring is galaxy season there's not a lot of nebulas um so there are nebulas up there but they're small faint or you have to wait till um later in the evening when more of the summer targets um but this is where you're really going to want some aperture you're really going to want some focal length if you're going to be observing the targets that are up at the moment because a lot of what we're observing right now is currently going to be, you know, we have Leo, we have Virgo, Leo Minor, Ursa Major, Canis Venactaceae, Coma Berenices, uh, all those major stuff, Ursa Major, I think I already said that, but right now it's primarily galaxies at the moment, and galaxies really take advantage of dark skies, large aperture telescopes, and if you're imaging, some focal length to get you some image scale. All the nice big nebulas, um, like everything that's in the hunter that's basically gone with the winter targets uh the summer targets are coming um obviously we see hercules rising uh so you have m13 that's just around the corner but it's still a little low uh, by the end of the month however it's going to be getting nice and high um and then by the complete end of the month we already have the summer triangle starting to make its appearance around 8:30. So we have uh, Vega, we have Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Um, by about 9.30, the Summer Triangle has already broken the horizon. Um, that's at the end of the month. So all those summertime objects are starting to come. You know, we have Centaurus. So if you're going to be at Texas, Omega Centauri is sitting down there, Centaurus A. And then, of course, later in the evening, you have Scorpio, Ophiuchus, and all those really big um, summer target, uh, summer constellations are actually starting to rise. And then over here in the northern part, we have Cepheus um, that's starting to make its way up um, and will start to be more visible come around 10 o'clock at the end of the month. Um, Cepheus, I think, is one of the coolest constellations for imagers because it's basically a giant dust bowl. Um, there's just nebulas, all kinds of weird exotic dusty targets um sit in cepheus a lot of totem targets um target of the month uh we're gonna start digging into cepheus probably uh later in the summer where you get all that really dusty nitty gritty fun stuff um we'll be digging into cepheus quite a bit um so prepare yourself uh but yeah right now we're in spring lots of galaxies if you really like the summer uh, objects they are coming up towards the end of the month especially as we move into june uh so deep sky targets uh first one's m106 this is one of my favorite targets to image because it's such a dynamic uh galaxy uh, this is in canis venactaceae it's about 25 million light years away uh visually as with any galaxies you're really going to want to get into darker skies anything galaxy wise is going to be tough from city it's just going to look fuzzy um darker skies are going to reveal more detail um m106 has these really beautiful arms um where it's there and there's a lot of really crazy galaxies in the field as well especially right down here um i should have looked this up before um we did anything but let's see uh let's see hold on let me pull this up real quick i want to double check uh what galaxy that is because it's a cool edge on uh galaxy there let me center this um 
I believe that is NGC forty two seventeen. Um, yeah, it doesn't come up, so I'll have to look it up. But yeah, there's a bunch of cool galaxies in this area, and that's what you're gonna find with a lot of the uh, regions uh, of this time of year. A lot of a lot of the major constellations. There's just clusters of galaxies everywhere, like Virgo, Ursa Major, Leo. Um, there's all coma cluster. There's all kinds of galaxy clusters up there. But M106 is very easy to find. It's fairly bright. It's a great imaging target. There's lots of detail packed in the core. I would really recommend if you have a monochrome camera to put some hydrogen alpha data into this image to help pop some of those H2 or star forming regions out. But what's really cool about M106, probably one of the things I think is my favorite about M106 is the supermassive black hole that sits in the middle of the galaxy is whipping up all this material. And in hydrogen alpha, or in the deep part of the red portion of the spectrum, there are an extra set of arms in M106 that are kind of slated around the core of the galaxy and this is material that the black hole is actually whipping up and spinning around the core of the galaxy. And it's actually visible in hydrogen alpha. And they're very cool little delicate arms. Um, of course, Hubble has an amazing image of it. But you can actually get it in an amateur telescope. I don't know if I actually have all that. Let me dig all this up. I wonder if I actually have the image of this, if I can find it really quick um, to actually pull this up. Let's see if I have the H alpha uh, master frame. There it is. So here's M106, the same star field. This is in hydrogen alpha, but if we zoom in, you can see right here, this little arm is the, is the arm I'm talking about the extra red arms of M106. That is material that's being whipped up by the black hole that's in the center of the galaxy. And that's using, this was a five nanometer hydrogen alpha filter that popped that out. But you can see there's all kinds of star forming regions that are inside M106. So if you wanna bring those out, I really recommend adding a little hydrogen alpha data. I think this is only like two hours worth. Um, but go ahead and pop that in there, but you can see that really cool arm right there. It's very delicate. Uh, but some good H alpha data will definitely pop that out. And it's just awesome to see material that's being whipped up by a black hole 30 million odd light years away. Um, you can do this in town. Galaxies are usually pretty forgiving. Um, there, But there's no filter that really helps you out other than a light pollution filter or darker skies. Um, another one, uh, M104. This is the Sombrero Galaxy. Uh, this is in Corvus the Crow, 30 million light years away. This one's good in town, but it does benefit from darker skies and it is kind of small. So some focal length is very helpful. There's some very cool detail you can get in this galaxy, especially along the edge of the dust bands. Um, but it's a cool galaxy. Filters are really not gonna do anything for you here. It's just either pound away on it or go to darker skies. Um, H alpha really probably won't do a whole lot. Although there are a lot of interesting things being found by people doing very deep hydrogen alpha exposures. Like they've done that with M31. Um, there's all kinds of uh, nebulosity running around that field. So um, if you have time and the equipment, I would recommend just as an experiment to just pound away on some popular targets like galaxies with filters that you generally wouldn't recommend it. Probably a lot of times might be, a, I wouldn't say a waste, but you just don't know what you're going to get. But you might be surprised that you might find something in the star field, especially with these very sensitive cameras and fast optics nowadays, you might be able to pull out stuff that people just don't know is there. Um, so don't be afraid to kind of blaze your own trail and experiment with some equipment and see what you get out of it. Um, this is M104. It does a very nice job in like a 10 or 12 inch telescope. Obviously bigger telescopes are more helpful, but it does look like a little tiny sombrero. Um, it's kind of a cool one to see. For imaging, it is rather small, longer focal length. Um, if you're doing visual, definitely want to add some magnification to pop it out a little bit. Um, 
but yeah, give it a go. What was I? we were looking at this the other day um, at an event. What was I running? And it worked pretty good. Um, I was running my 31 Nagler on my 28 inch. Um, that was about 90 power. So about 90 power does a very nice job um, pulling all that out. Um, but that is a fun little galaxy for you to actually go check out. And it's a fun one to do for outreach. Um, so definitely, definitely try it out. Uh, next up, of course, is the Leo triplet. Very cool collection of galaxies. Sometimes you luck out where you can get multiple galaxies in one field of view, the Leo triplet being one of them. You can at least get two of them, uh, sometimes three, depending on how dark the skies are. Um, NGC 3628, which is the larger galaxy right here, is fairly invisible visually unless you're in darker skies. Um, but it also has a very faint tail at the end of it. And the only way to really pull this tail out is long exposures or a really good luminance uh, frame to help pull that out. This was shot in Florida from a backyard, which is very impressive, the amount of detail that's there. Um, with these galaxies from just a backyard image, but from dark skies, you can pull out a lot more of this faint detail, especially the tail that's coming off of NGC 3628, and you'd be amazed what's actually floating around in there. But again, deep, long exposures, especially with luminance, um, lots of time to pull that out. But don't forget to get some nice detail in M65 and M66. And then visually, see what you can pull out, especially if you're in a darker sky. Give it some aperture, like a 10, 12 inch, even an 8 inch does a nice job. 6 inch will do it, easy. Um, but more aperture. Galaxies tend to pop more once you've hit that 12 inch aperture or bigger. There's just something where you're finally getting enough light throughput to actually see more detail. So if you're into galaxies, I would definitely recommend a 12 inch or larger uh, instrument. Um, that's just what I find works the best. Of course, dark skies. Now, continuing on with that two for one deal, uh, we have M81 and M82. These are probably the easiest galaxies to see this time of year. Um, both of them generally fit in the field of view. They're about 12 million light years away. They're right at the, um, upper portion of Ursa major off the bowl. Um, but it's a good one to go after. Now, what's very cool about this from a imaging standpoint is you have all this dust. It's called integrated flux nebula. It's like cirrus clouds that just go through the region. It is packed full of, we call it IFN to abbreviate it, integrated flux nebula. So there's tons of IFN floating around this region. And you'll be very surprised what you'll find uh, just floating around, but it's very delicate. So long exposures, dark skies, or a good luminance channel will help pull that out as well. Now, the thing here with M81 and M82 um, is don't forget to do the H-alpha fr uh, frames because they're actually going to help pop out the red portions that are in M82. You can see this really cool red area in the Cigar Galaxy. This is M82. This is M81. Um, M82, this red detail is very hard to pull out unless you're going to use a lot of red or hydrogen alpha uh, filters can definitely help pop that detail out. And there is some star forming regions in M81 as well, um, as long as a bunch of little stuff in there. But that uh, H-alpha frame will really help pull out uh, all this data right here in the red portion of the spectrum for M82. Um, but yeah, give it some good detail and help pop out uh, the integrated flux nebula there. Uh, next up is the Sunflower Galaxy. This is M63. This is in Canis Venactices, uh, 27 million light years away. This is a cool galaxy just because of all the detail that's in there. Um, there's lots of structure, obviously, why it gets its name the sunflower, because it looks like a sunflower. That is visible in larger aperture telescopes. You can get that detail in there. Um, I wouldn't say grain or molting, um, but it does have some really cool uh, uh, details inside there to make it the sunflower galaxy. The black eye galaxy is another one, which I don't have an image of, but that one's very easy. It looks 
just like it does in a picture, even in a moderate telescope from decent skies. Um, in town, this galaxy is pretty forgiving. There's not much you can do for it as far as filtration goes, though. You can use like an L Pro or, or something to knock the light pollution down, but really it's a galaxy. There's not a lot you can do about it um, other than just give some good exposures and learn how to process gradients out of your your frame if you're shooting in town. Obviously, darker skies just make that easier. Uh, next up is NGC 4565 and Coma Berenices, about 43 million light years away. This galaxy is one of my favorites. It's huge um, as well. Darker skies is really where it comes out. Uh, in town, it's very easy to do for imaging, and it is an edge on spiral, like you're looking straight down the edge there. And it really is quite forgiving uh, in light polluted skies because of how uh, contained it actually is. There's not a lot of extensive uh, arms or detail or very thin wispy detail that um, leaves the galaxy. It's very contained within its region. So if you're dealing with gradients or something like light pollution gradients in town, you can actually deal with it fairly accurately because of how contained this is. You're not going to lose any of that really faint, uh, subtle detail that might be sitting out there. Um, dark skies, this is a very fun one to see visually. Again, if you're doing that 8-inch or larger telescope, it really pops. This in a large aperture telescope, like a 18 or 20 or bigger, is huge. Um, I've seen this in a 36-inch daub, and it takes up almost the whole field of view. It looks like a massive UFO um, in the field. It's very cool to see. So something that's got some serious aperture, NGC 4565 is like a staple um, that you really need to check out. It's an awesome galaxy, and it's very easy to image as well. Of course, one of the biggest ones that's up right now is the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. This is in Canis Venactices, um, which is basically the tail of Ursa Major. It's just off the Big Dipper handle, about 30 million light years away. This one, it is a Messier target, but visually in town, it is tricky um, to actually see any detail. I've done this um, in a half-decent sky with my 28 and all you can see is the glowing core of the main galaxy m51 right here and it's a little companion that's there you can see it but it is far from what it looks like in an image so this is not a very forgiving visual target in town you really need to get out to some darker skies to see this one of the best views i've actually seen of this galaxy is in a 120 millimeter refractor from darker skies and it just i don't know what it was the contrast just popped it looked like this picture not, not as much detail obviously but you could see the spiral arms look like a quarter just sitting there in space because it is a face on spiral but what you'll notice from larger aperture telescopes in darker skies is you'll start to notice the bridge between the galaxies are more visible and the dust that actually extends out away from the galaxies is much more visible in larger aperture instruments so highly recommend this target um, in more of a moderate dark sky site six inch or larger will take care of it bigger telescopes you get much more detail in the arms it looks more like a picture um, imaging it's fairly forgiving um, in town but what you tend to lose in town is a lot of that faint detail that you can kind of see out here I think it kind of looks like a, a snail um, upside down this being the you know the shell of the snail and then this being the head over here and it does look like it has some little antennas um, with the dust detail out here I think it looks like a snail um, that's just kind of inching away through space. Um, but what you'll notice if you're imaging this in town is a lot of that faint dust detail, you'll probably have a harder time pulling out. Whereas in dark sky sites, it should be a lot more easy, especially in longer exposures to pull out that detail. There also are a lot of H2 regions inside of M51. So adding a little bit of H alpha, if you're doing um, monochrome imaging, um, you can isolate the hydrogen alpha wavelength 
and help pop out those H2 regions and then process that in and it gives a little bit of pop um, to your object or target in your image. So those are just a collection of objects that are up right now. There's so many good galaxies and objects to observe right now. We just could do a whole hour episode on that if we wanted to, but we don't have time for that. So these are just a little sprinkling of targets that are up right now. Hopefully you guys get some good stuff. Um, and speaking of good stuff, it's target of the month, Totem. Um, I know some of you have not received your patch from March. We haven't really been in the office lately because of traveling for Neef and all that. Neef is a huge production and we are getting ready to go to Texas Star Party in about two weeks. So there's just a lot going on. We do have everybody's submission for April already put together. Um, so those patches will be shipping out here and we'll go. We'll try to get back and do the March patches and get those shipped out um, so we're not waiting too much longer for that. But all the April submissions have been collected. Um, they're also all in this presentation. If you've never heard of Target of the Month or Totem, here are the rules. You must be able to provide an image by the end of the month. You have to shoot the target within the month. No old data or any of that. Um, there were some questions at Neef about this. You can use a remote observatory if you have access to one. It doesn't necessarily have to be your telescope. You do have to collect the data, obviously, and process it. And it has to be done within the month of the totem target. Um, any submissions, you have to email to totem, T-O-T-M, at skywatchusa.com. Your submission must be sent in by the last day of the month. And you need to provide your name, equipment, image specifications like exposure, um, your mailing address. And this is only for the U.S. and Canada just because it does get pricey shipping stuff all over the world. And you also need to provide a raw file or fit file or whatever it is that shows you when this image was actually acquired. Those are the rules of Totem. Obviously, this is an astrophotography only challenge because we need to know that you got it. Um, visually, it's harder to do. Uh, this is currently the patch for 2023. Uh, patches change every year. Um, so there was the 2022 patch. There's 2023. Um, we're already working on 2024. Uh, so that'll be kind of cool. Um, but this is this year's patch. These are either a patch and they also are adhesive on the back. So you can stick them to all kinds of stuff um, if you want to show that you actually did it. So uh, that is what you receive for doing the totem target challenge. Now, April... Um, our challenge was the box. Um, the box is a little galaxy uh, group. And a lot of you did a very nice job on this. We had a ton of entries um, as well. So here's all the entries that we got um, this month. You guys did a very nice job on it. I know it's a very challenging target because it's small, as are most galaxies. But some of you did a very, very good job on acquiring data um, for this. I hope you enjoyed the challenge. Um, but a lot of you did a very, everyone did a great job on this. So we definitely appreciate everyone who took a swing at it. Um, that's the whole point of Totem is to get you to kind of push the limits and go off the deep end of what you're used to actually shooting. Um, obviously the Messier targets and all the easy fun stuff is out there, but we want to get you to actually attempt to go off the deep end and find something different. So we take some time trying to dig up these targets so you guys can actually uh, have a challenge of, and maybe push your, your equipment or your imaging capabilities, and maybe you'll find something that's actually kind of suits your fancy um, and get you to try and branch out to try different targets. So anyway, those were all the submissions for April. Thank you all for uh, submitting your images. We really appreciate it. Great job to all of you for trying to get a hold of the box. Um, so it was a good challenge target. Uh, now we're gonna continue on with the galaxy theme for May. Um, this is NGC 4762, the paper kite galaxy in Virgo, 58 million light years away. This is a really interesting galaxy um, because it has these interesting arms that just kind of peel off into space. There's a lot of very delicate detail in this galaxy. So try to pull some of that detail out in those uh, arms there and 
uh, get some cool detail there in the core because it is edge on. Um, so this is a very interesting galaxy. It's one of my favorites. It's very overlooked. You don't find a lot of information on this one, but NGC 4762, the paper kite galaxy. Um, this is a very cool one to go after and that will be our May challenge target. So good luck to you all. I'm really interested to see what you guys pull out of this um, galaxy just because there's not a ton of images on it. They do exist. People have shot it before, obviously, but I'll be really curious to see what you guys can get um, on this. Again, some focal length can be helpful on it because it is a galaxy and they're rather small, but uh, we're excited to see what you guys can pull out of that. Um, that's pretty much it for this episode. Uh, really appreciate you guys being here. If you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on the channel. Let's us know we're doing a good job. If you have an idea for a future episode, please email us at info at skywatcherusa.com. Title it What's Up so we know what you're writing in about. Um, but that is May Night Skies. Uh, next week is planning nightscapes. This will be another live episode. Uh, we will be all back, um, or I'll be back. Um, we'll be talking about how to plan for nightscapes to get those really cool scenic, uh, shots. We may have a special guest join us. I'm not sure yet. We're trying to pin that down. Um, but that is next week's episode. That's 10 a.m. Pacific right here at the Skywatcher USA channel on May 12th. Um, and then a couple days after that, we will be heading to Texas star party. So the week following, the 12th, which is, that would be the 19th. Um, May 19th will be a recorded episode. Um, so we'll be talking about, we'll be doing another pre-recorded episode there. But next week we'll be live and I'll be back in person uh, for planning nightscapes. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the May Night Skies episode for 2023. Really appreciate you being here. Um, thanks for watching. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Again, if you want to go pick up some cool Skywatcher swag, head over to uh, skywatcher.threadless.com and check all that out. Um, other than that, please have a great weekend. Uh, clear skies to all of you. Get out and do some observing, even though it is full moon. Go share the full moon with somebody. Um, you never know who you're going to inspire and get into this awesome hobby of ours. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Clear skies, and we'll see you guys next Friday. Take care. See ya. Bye.